if I wanted to prove P implies Q using a direct proof, how does that proof begin? What do I assume to be true at the beginning of my proof? If I'm going to prove this statement directly. Yeah, right. Which proposition is that? Yeah, so I'm going to assume that P is true. So if I'm doing a direct proof, I would say let K be an even number. So that would be, that would signal to the reader, so if I'm reading your proof, I know that you're proving this claim, and I read this thing at the beginning of your proof, that signals to me that you're about to do a direct proof, right? You're assuming that the premise is true. Um, and if once we assume that the premise is true, what's the burden of proof? What do we have to deduce if we're proving this directly? Q. And so very often, what you'll write here is, to prepare the reader, we want to show that 2k plus 1 is odd. So that's again, that's the marker that we're about to do a direct proof. We've assumed that the premise is a true statement, and we're preparing the reader for an argument that the conclusion is a true statement. Um, and so at the end, you'd probably also have a sentence that reinforces that. Therefore, 2k plus 1 is odd. And of course, as every writer of proof knows, it's what happens in there, that's the tricky part. Um, but very often, especially when you're sort of a, just growing into your proof skin, um, I'll recommend that people sort of scaffold out a proof like this at the very beginning, so that the main elements of the structure are there so that the reader knows what kind of argument you're trying to make. Um, and then you can worry about filling in the details uh, in there afterwards. Um, but for now, I want us just to focus on structure. So there would be the form of a direct proof for this statement. And direct proof tends to be the right play um, when either the, the hypothesis here, the P, when the premise is something that gives you a lot to work with, like maybe it's a definition that has like a whole ton of criteria that are all satisfied for it, right? If it gives you a lot of material, um, then it can be really valuable. Also, if the conclusion, if the Q, is something that seems like it's, it's fairly quick to prove, right? Um, so direct proof might be the way to go. What if we wanted to do this proof using a contraposition strategy instead? So proof by contrapositive. What would I assume in that case? I would assume, I would assume not Q, right. So this is not Q. Um, so this is sometimes in philosophy courses called uh, denying the consequent, right? So we're going to assume that the conclusion of this thing does not hold. So how would that look in this example? Let 2k plus 1 be, yeah, let me just say not odd. Just, I, I want to be right. So I just want to be super careful. Let, so suppose that 2k, minus one, 2K plus 1 is not odd. Um, sometimes, too, proof writers, rather than using the word let here, if they want to reinforce that they're about to make an indirect argument, they'll, they'll be puckish about it. Say, Let's suppose that 2k plus 1 is not odd. Right? Um, okay, so if that's, our, if that's our opening maneuver here, then what's our burden of proof? What do we then have to deduce if we're going to prove this by contraposition? Not. Not P, right. And so, again, particularly when you're arguing indirectly, it really helps the reader to see that setup explicitly. We want to show that, and what would not P look like? K is not even. Yep. So you take the, the premise, the P here, and deny it. Right? And so we want to show that that's true. So then the conclusion of your proof would repeat that again. Therefore, K is not even. And that would be a proof by contraposition. It's maybe the unsung hero of indirect proof. Because I think very often, the other form of indirect proof that you learn, proof by contradiction, tends to be the one that people remember more. Um, but it has a really funky form. So let's talk about that one last. Contradiction proofs have a big assumption at the beginning, an even bigger assumption than the one we just made here. In particular, we get to assume two things at the beginning of a contradiction proof, which is another reason that it can be popular a lot of times, because it'll give you a lot of material to work with. We're going to assume that P is true, but we're also going to assume that Q is false. So this is nice because it immediately puts a lot of stuff on the table that you can work with. So in our example, suppose k is even, and what else? 
2k plus 1 is not odd. So we get a lot to work with. But what's the cost of that? What becomes our burden of proof when we prove something by contradiction? At the end of a contradiction proof, you need to show that there exists a logical proposition, we'll call it R, which is both a true statement and a false statement. So that's what the end of a contradiction proof looks like. That the assumption that P is Q and that Q is false logically implies the existence of a logical statement which is both true and false, which is absurd in propositional logic. And therefore, we must conclude that our assumption cannot be sustained. So in this case, who knows what it would be? Um, but we would probably find out at some place along the line. Uh, we'll show that there exists a number which is, both, uh, which is neither even nor odd or something. Uh, show that there exists an R in Z which is neither even nor odd, or something. But that's one of the things that makes contradiction proofs challenging and fun, uh, is that you have to discover something that violates the laws of the logical universe. Um, and as soon as you show that, then you can say at the end, um, therefore, the assumption cannot be sustained. Uh, the assumption PN not Q is false.